tonight is a really special evening. Um, it inaugurates um, this year's evening series of uh, lectures and programs here at the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Um, and so I'd like to both welcome you and thank you for coming out for um, our programming. Uh, and more importantly, um, it inaugurates a new era here at the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Uh, we are here this evening not just to hear and then discuss uh, what will undoubtedly be an excellent and engaging lecture from our good colleague in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Africana Studies, Tina Camp. But as many of you know, Tina has joined the BCRW this year as the co-director, and in July of 2015, will take over as director when I step down after 15 years. So this is a very important moment of beginnings for us. Um, I will remain as part of the BCRW team as an internal faculty research fellow, um, and I look forward to being able in that role to participate in all the ways in which the programs, projects, and publications of BCRW will undoubtedly become bigger and better and have an even greater impact on our world and on possibilities for realizing feminist social justice under Tina's leadership. I will return to a more substantive introduction of Tina in a moment. I'm gonna talk for longer than usual, just so you know this time, because it, it, this is really a hugely important night for the center. Um, but uh, the start of this new era is auspicious in a number of ways. First of all, as you see before you today, we published the most recent issue of our um, web journal, The Scholar and Feminist Online. This issue, Activism and the Academy, is based on the 40th anniversary conference um, for the center itself. So the center started in 1971 and the um, Scholar and Feminist Conference in 1974. Um, and the issue as a whole, I think, provides both a sense of the work that we've done in the four decades leading up to this moment and um, a foundation for some of the many decades that are to come. Um, so I encourage you to um, go to the web and check out this very new issue of the journal. And I wanna thank Catherine Sammy, um, Ann Jonas, uh, and Hope Dechter, uh, for all the work that they did, and Nietzsche Yen also, who's a contributor, for all the work that they did um, in bringing this issue out at this moment, because it's really very exciting. Um, and um, this is not just the beginning of Tina's leadership of the BCRW, uh, but also the moment at which we inaugurate a new initiative at the BCRW, the BCRW Fellows Program. Um, at BCRW, we, we try to think about our work seriously in many ways, and also specifically in this case about what it means to be a center of activity. Um, at the 40th anniversary conference, Sarita C. suggested that we should imagine our work in terms of the metaphor of a centrifuge, and that talk is part of the um, issue, so you can see it online if you would like. Um, and her idea was that a center uh, like BCRW should be a place where materials come together, are changed, and then spin out again in order to affect the world um, in new ways. And I found this to be a very compelling metaphor. And for the Pellows, Fellows Program, we have been able to bring together a number of different initiatives which have allowed us to now assemble a range of fellows who are working across feminist issues, across feminist generations, across continents, and even across genders. Um, the, the initiatives that we brought together started very small, as things often do here at uh, BCRW, with um, an essentially unfunded, except with our love and support, uh, alumni fellowship, which was inaugurated by Sidney Mosley, uh, uh, then held by Ebony Smith, and this year is held by um, Ali Rosa Salas. Um, and then we brought in Raina Gossett as our first activist fellow, um, who did a series of talks, and again, the, um, one of the videos from this project is um, uh, online um, in a project that, that is called No One Is Disposable. Um, and then we were very fortunate to have a very um, generous gift that allowed us to uh, bring together and fund two senior activist fellows, um, Catherine Acey and Amber Hollabob, who many of you know, um, and who have worked for their lives to create the feminist social justice that we imagine um, here at BCRW, who have learned a lot along the way, um, and who are here now for the next two to four years to share that knowledge and to do pr the projects that they always imagined they might want to do. So watch out world, um, uh, <laughs> uh, but haven't had time to do. 
Um, we then were able to bring this gift together with other initiatives from some are college level initiatives, some are new undertakings to create a fellow that, a program that includes eight fellows and they are, um, and I'm not going to have a chance to interview, in, introduce everybody in the depth that they deserve, but, and please hold your applause and then we can clap at the end. Um, as I mentioned, Catherine T. Acey, Lama Bowie, Raina Gossett, Amber Hollabaugh, Ali Rosa Silas, Entosaki Shange, Naomi Wolf, and Nietzsche Yin, who is our post -back fellow, a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Varner College in 2014. So please. <laughs> this group also includes three internal faculty fellows who um, are Yvette Christiansa and Shione Mitri and Jonathan Beller. Um, and two research scholars, Henry Abelov and Courtney Howland. So we are thrilled to have this team of people at our little center. As you know, um, we sit basically so that there is no room between the people in the office. And now we're really happy that there are even more people sharing the office with us. So welcome to all of them. To get a sense of how important this initiative is, though, I did want to talk about just a couple of our fellows, both of whom um, uh, have um, been awarded the Barnard Medal of Distinction and we're so happy that they've been willing to come back and join us here um, for new projects at the BCRW. And those are, of course, um, the 2011 Nobel Peace Laureate, Lema Bowie, and um, our own Barnard Graduate Class of 1970, Entosaki Shange. This is just a taste of how important um, the people who are involved in this project and hence the project itself is. And I am just pulling the most, the smallest parts of their bios because believe me, we could be here all night. And in fact, we have uh, done major conferences with both of these uh, collaborators and those you can find online as well. Um, so Lema Bowie um, is uh, part of the leadership of the Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace, which brought together Christian and Muslim women in a nonviolent movement that played a pivotal role in ending Liberia's civil war in 2003. It's chronicled in her memoir, Mighty Be Our Powers, and in the documentary, Play the Devil Back to Hell. She serves, among many other projects, on the board of the Nobel, board of directors of the Nobel, Women's, the Nobel Women's Initiative, the Bowie Peace Foundation, and the Peace Jam Foundation. And she is a member of the African Women Leaders Network for Reproductive Health and um, Family Planning. Among the many awards that she has uh, um, um, received, are the 2013 Barnard Medal of Distinction, the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize, the 2010 John Jay Medal for Justice, the 2009 John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award, and the 2009 Gruber Prize for Women's Rights. Um, this year, she's working with South Sudanese women on um, pushing forward the efforts uh, for peace that she has um, begun over all these years of work, and we're very honored that she's part of our um, a team that is working here at the BCRW this year. Entosaki Shange is um, probably best known um, for her choreo poem for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, but she has pursued so many different artistic projects that have had such an important activist effect um, on our world that it's impossible to name. We had a two-day conference just trying to think about some of the contributions that she's made. In addition to the 1988 Barnard Medal of Distinction, she, her awards, and again, this is just choosing a few, include an Obie Award, an Outer Critics Circle Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, an Obie Award in 1981 for Mother, Mother Courage and Her Children, The Adaptation, a Paul Robeson Achievement Award, and nominations for a Tony Award, a Grammy Award, and an Emmy Award, which are worthwhile uh, thinking about because it gives you some sense of the range of Ms. Shange's contributions. Um, just a couple of things. This is what people have said about her work, and I think that this tells us um, uh, all we need to know, maybe not. No, definitely not all we need to know. I take that back. It tells us just a little bit about what we need to know about Entosaki Shange's work. The word that best describes Shange's work, which are not plays in the traditional sense, is power. That's from Don Nelson writing in the New York Daily News um, uh, about spell number seven. This is from the New Yorker um, uh, about the public theater production of For Colored Girls. 
The evening grows in dramatic power, encompassing, it seems, every feeling and experience a woman has ever had, strong and funny. It is entirely free of the rasping earnestness of most projects of this sort. The verses and monologues that constitute the program have been very well chosen, contrasting in mood, yet always subtly building. We are very fortunate to have with us Entosaki Shange, who is a writer, performer, and teacher. And she will be joining in our students and with Professor Kim Hall on a project called The Worlds of Shange. And we hope to publish it as a digital Shange project over the course of the next four years. So please welcome Entosaki Shange. All right, on to the business of the evening. I hope you're excited. We are. Um, and I hope you can see some of what's coming up. Um, just a couple of things. Our um, uh, alumni fellow, Ali Rosa Salas, has organized an event on November 8th called No Such Thing as Neutral. Amber Holaba is organizing a conference on queer survival economies with the Murphy Center at CUNY in January. And as I mentioned, Raina Gossett's uh, film, film and video project, No One is Disposable, will offer new videos in the spring. So you can find all of this online. Um, and uh, I hope that you see the kind of excitement that we feel about this new era of uh, BCRW. All right. Now, to return to the idea that BCRW is becoming a more exciting place. Now, I hope I have already provided enough evidence for this. <laughs> And let me say at this point that BCRW has been a very exciting place for the past 40 years. Uh, from the first public event, which was entitled, Is There Sexism at Columbia University? <laughs> and Jane Gould, the, the first uh, permanent director of the center, said it was an evening of high comedy. And as you can see, it still is. <laughs> yes, exactly. It continues, exactly. Um, to the first Scotland Feminist Conference in 1974, which brought out 2,000 people. Uh, to the 1982 uh, Scotland Feminist Conference on the Politics of Sexuality. And yes, Amber Holliba, we do have pictures of you and your haircut from that time. Um, to the working groups that Tema Kaplan brought together when I first started this job, people who participated in those working groups would come up to me and stop me at events and say, Tema Kaplan changed my life. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> To the Center Courses for Alumni, um, which Leslie Kalman has been teaching my, my immediate predecessor for uh, nearly 25 years now. To the founding of the New Se Feminist Solutions Projects in 2002 with Nobel Peace Laureate Jody Williams. And of um, Scholar and Feminist Online in um, 2003. Let me just say that it's been a fun ride. Nonetheless, it is my firm belief that under Tina's leadership, the best is yet to come. And while I have learned that past performance does not predict future results, I have a couple of, piece of pieces of evidence to offer for this firm relief. First, I think that BCRW is in an incredible place, and I want to thank everyone who has collaborated with the center and who has served on our advisory board for that, because I think that has made us strong in a moment when not all feminist social justice projects are um, at, at, at their most well supported. And so I'm very grateful to all of you for the support that you have offered to us. And two, the fact that it is Tina who will provide the necessary leadership for our new era. Tina Kent is Anne Whitney Olin Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies in Africana Studies. She is the former director of the Africana Studies program and the first chair of the Africana Studies department. Special shout out to Kim F. Hall, too. <laughs> Professor Kant joined the Barnard faculty in 2010, prior to which she held faculty positions at Duke University, the University of California, um, Santa Cruz, and the Technical University of Ber Berlin. Professor Ch Camp's research theorizes gendered, racial, and diasporic formation in black communities in Germany and Europe more broadly. She is the author of Other Germans, Black Germans, and the Politics of Race, Gender and Memory in the Third Reich, and of Image Matters, Archive Photography, and the African Diaspora in Europe. Um, she has many, many, many more publications, which I cannot list here, and is also, like everyone, um, the uh, recipient of many uh, research fellowships and grants, including um, those from the American Association of University Women, the German Academic Exchange Service, the Social Science Research Council, 
and the Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities. As this record shows, Tina is an extraordinary scholar and feminist, carrying on the best traditions of BCRW. And I'm so happy to be celebrating her publicly um, for the first time as both director of BCRW and as the McIntyre lecturer. Ellie Elliott, one of the founders of BCRW, donated the gift in honor of her friend Helen Pond McIntyre. And having this be Tina's first public event is a wonderful moment of continuity over the course of our 40 years of existence. But Tina is also an incredibly creative scholar who is innovative, and that word is, I think, overly used now, but in this case, I feel that it is utterly appropriate, and I just want to give you one example of that, which is to highlight for you just a little about how to Tina has pushed the concept of diaspora over and pursued it over the broad course of her work. I think it's fair to say that Tina is one of the people who brought the study of diaspora to the fore of the academic thinking, and that concept in and of itself, um, before Tina even became a member of our faculty, was what we used in forming the new um, uh, concentration on the study of race and ethnicity and the interdisciplinary minor on the study of race and ethnicity here. So we're very um, grateful to have such a scholar who has made such an impact. Um, but that doesn't mean that she stopped simply with bringing forward an important concept. She has continued to pursue it in innovative ways throughout her work. And just as one example of this, I want to highlight um, uh, the special issue of um, the longstanding journal Feminist Review that she ever uh, edited with Deborah Thomas, who's here this evening, um, uh, on transnational feminist studies and the study of the African diaspora. These are two fields that one might think would come together with ease, and yet there are many ways in which they have not um, that that sense of affinity or possible affinity has um, not been fully pursued until people with the kind of vision that Tina offers um, uh, were able to push that work forward. Tina will bring this kind of incisive and innovative thinking to BCRW, and I don't see how the results will be anything short of fabulous. But speaking of fabulosity, uh, I do want to say one thing on a personal note. Uh, before introducing our real speaker for the evening, um, uh, because this is an important moment for me personally too. This is my 15th year here, and I'm just so, so, so happy and relieved um, that such an incredible person should be uh, the next director of the center. Um, and in order to talk about that, I decided to use a sports metaphor, because I know that's what you were looking for here. <laughs> Um, although I did once introduce the McIntyre lecture with a long discourse on the TV show Grey's Anatomy, so you're actually probably better off with the sports metaphor. Um, I ran track in college. Uh, I was a sprinter. I ran 100 meters, 200 meters, uh, 100 meters again in the sprint medley, and 100 meters again in the sprint medley, adding up to 400 whole meters. Um, the sprint medley was my favorite of these events because I got to start that event. Um, and. I ran, that, I ran the initial leg, and then I handed off to another sprinter who ran 100. Then our teammates ran 200 and 400 meter legs. My favorite part of the whole thing was the handoff, which is not every runner's favorite part, because it's where you can really blow it for the whole team. But fortunately, that never happened. Instead, the handoff was always a moment of great joy. What happens when you run one of these medleys is you, your um, teammate stands in what is called the zone. And she stands there at the back of the zone. You come in at a particular moment in your running. She starts so that by that time the handoff comes, you are both running full speed. You then say a signal. She puts her hand back. She does not look at you. You put the baton in her hand, and it never slows down for an instant. It was always thrilling to be running full speed with someone else and manage to have the baton go from one hand to another. This is how I feel about this entire year in which I get to co-direct with Tina. It feels to me as if we are both running full speed. We're in the zone, and it is thrilling. Tina Kant. Wow. <laughs> Let's just start with a collective sigh of wow. Um, um, I had some things to say that were not actually going to be the talk. One of those things that I wanted to say was I wanted to express the sheer joy um, of this handoff, but you sort of stolen that. 
<laughs> I, I mean, it's always best to leave a beautiful phrase in the room to inhabit that space rather than to try and top it. <laughs> so it is with great humility and extraordinary enthusiasm that I come to this podium after you, that I step into the shoes, the big ass shoes that you wear, um, and that I have to contradict you in all of that talk about a new era. What new era? Do we need a new era? I don't know that BCRW needs a new era. I really think that what BCRW needs is a continuation, and a continuation that channels the decades of enthusiasm that other directors have actually put into place, and which have been catalyzed and propelled over the last 15 years under you, Janet Jacobson. That said, what I'm going to do today is take you on a little bit of a journey. Um, the journey is, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic. <laughs> I'm speaking from the place that so many of us as scholars, activists, artists um, inhabit when we're at the beginning of a project that takes us in a direction that we don't expect. And one of the ways in which I try and account for that is by being open to the various directions that we get forced to go into and trying to share this academic, intellectual, theoretical exercise not as a completed thought, not as one that I know the end to, but one that is still certainly and very much in progress. So I'm taking a chance of sharing that journey with you. So I hope that you'll indulge me for a minute in the fact that it doesn't have a proper ending. It has some possibilities and some suggestions. So without further delay, it's organized into three sections. So section one, Black Futurity, a feminist grammar lesson. About a month ago, I was taking a walk with a close friend in the woods near her home. We walk frequently when I visit her at her place in the country. She has long legs and a purposeful stride, and I frequently find myself galloping to keep up with her or grabbing her arm and begging her to slow down. But I love our walks, not so much because of the landscape or the scenery, which is calming and beautiful. I love our walks because of the conversations, which are mostly about writing. We're both stubborn and forthright and at times brutally honest. And there's something about walking and talking outdoors that blunts the force of tough and challenging criticism. On our walk a few weeks back, I found myself hedging on a point I've been struggling with for a while now in my work. I heard myself fumbling defensively to articulate what it was I wanted to say. Taking a chance on the generosity of friendship, I eventually blurted out, the thing is, I just don't want people to think I'm a naive optimist. At that point, my friend stopped walking, turned to me and said, but Tina, you are an optimist. You may not be naive, but you're definitely an optimist. And I thought, damn, is it that obvious? <laughs> I begin my remarks this evening with this particular story not as a spoiler alert about where this talk might eventually end up, because it kind of ends up in a very different place. Nor do I do so to undermine my credibility immediately with this audience, which I may already have done. I share it with you as a way of framing the larger question that motivates me. Specifically, what does it mean for a black feminist to think about, consider, or concede the concept of futurity? Now, I have to pause and scan the audience for any of my students who happen to be in the audience because they can tell you exactly what comes next, right? A definition. Futurity, root word, future. Noun, time that is to be or come hereafter. Something that will exist or happen in a time to come. A condition, especially of success or failure, to come. As an African-American feminist of a certain age, 
my hedging and defensiveness about being caught in the perhaps shameful, naive, or deluded act of optimism is directly related to the black feminist conundrum of being captured by and accountable to the historical impact of the Atlantic slave trade on the meaning of black womanhood in the Americas. It's a conundrum Hortense Spillers famously described in haunting terms in the opening lines of her 1987 essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book. Quote, let's face it, I am a marked woman, but not everybody knows my name. Peaches and brown sugar, sapphire and earth mother. Auntie, granny, God's holy fool, a Miss Ebony first or black woman at the podium. I describe a locus of confounded identities, a meeting ground of investments and privations in the national treasury of rhetorical wealth. My country needs me, and if I were not here, I would have to be invented. On the very same page of this, quite frankly to me, awesome text, Spillers explains that these terms capture her in a web of what she calls overdetermined nominative properties. She continues, they are markers so loaded and mythical, with mythical prepossession, that there's no easy way for agents buried beneath them to come clean. In order for me to speak a truer word of concerning myself, I must strip down through layers of attenuated meanings, made in excess in time, over time, assigned by a particular historical order, and there await whatever marvels of my own inventiveness. I must say, that 27 years since the publication of Spiller's seminal text, I share her sense of capture. But more importantly, I share the necessity to also see possibility in the tiny, often minuscule chinks and crevices of what may appear to be the inescapable web of that capture for black women and men alike. Like Spiller's, I too feel the need to engage those possibilities obliquely in the terms she presented so brilliantly back then which remain utterly salient for me today. They are terms found not so much in the foreground of her impactful text, but instead in their margins and interstices. They are terms and tenses of grammar. In Spiller's case, an American grammar book of the black female body. It's a grammar of black capture that echoes the equally profound statement she made in her earlier essay, Interstices, a small drama of words, that black women continue to await their verb. In his beautiful re revisiting of Spiller's work, Alexander Wehaleye describes her intervention as an attempt to theorize some general dimensions of modern subjectivity from the vantage point of black women in ways that, quote, develop a grammar and create a vocabulary that does not choose between addressing the specific location of black, woman, black women a broader theoretical register about what it means to be human during and in the aftermath of, tra of the transatlantic slave trade, and the imagination of liberation in the future anterior sense of the now. It's in a similarly grammatical sense, a grammar of futurity realized in the present, that I want to pose my opening question once again. What would it mean for a black feminist to think in the grammar of futurity? Futurity is for me not a question of hope, though it is certainly inextricably intertwined with the idea of aspiration. To me, it's crucial to think about futurity through a notion of tense. What is the tense of a black feminist future? It's a tense of anteriority, a tense relationship to an idea of possibility that is neither innocent nor naive, nor is it necessarily heroic or intentional. It's humble and strategic. It's subtle and discriminating. It's devious and exacting. It's not always loud and demanding. It's frequently quiet, opportunistic, dogged, and disruptive. The grammar that I'm proposing of black feminist futurity is a grammar of possibility that moves beyond a simple definition of the future tense as what will be in the future. It moves beyond the future perfect tense of that which will have happened prior to a reference point in the future. It strives for the tense of possibility grammarians refer to as the future real conditional, or that which will have had to happen. 
for the future to be realized. The grammar of black feminist futurity is a performance of a future that hasn't yet happened, but must. It's an attachment to a belief in what should be true, which in turn realizes that aspiration. It's the power to imagine beyond current fact, to envision that which is not but must be. Put another way, it's a form of prefiguration that involves living the future now as imperative rather than subjunctive, as a striving for the future you want to see. Some see the realization of such a future in the form of acts and actions. They see them in political movements and acts of resistance, like those that have produced fundamental shifts in the status of subordinated, subaltern, and marginalized groups. But I believe we must look as well as listen for it in other unlikely places. I locate it in the everyday imaging practices of black communities, present and past. And I've come to find it most recently in what I consider an alternative visual archive of the African diaspora. It's an archive composed of images intended not to figure black subjects, but to delineate instead differential or often degraded forms of personhood or subjection. They're photographic images produced with the purpose of identifying, classifying, tracking, managing, and constraining the movement of blacks in and out of diaspora. I call them quiet photography. They're images we associate with bureaucratic identification. There are, they are unexceptional photos that capture the quotidian practices of their subjects and the state. Rather than dismissing them, I suggest a counterintuitive approach to understanding their quietness, their quotidian nature, as well as the practices of rupture, refusal, and futurity such images also enact. Quiet, not noisy, still calm or motionless, absence of noise, quotidian, of or occurring every day, ordinary or every day, especially when mundane. What's the relationship between quiet and the quotidian? Each term references something assumed to go unspoken or unsaid, unremarked, unrecognized, or overlooked. They name practices that are pervasive and yet ever present, yet occluded by their seeming absence or erasure in repetition, routine, or internalization. Yet the quotidian is not equivalent to passive everyday acts, and quiet is not an absence of articulation or utterance. Quiet registers sonically as a level of intensity that commands focused attention. Quiet infuses sound with impact and affect and creates the possibility for us to register it as meaningful at all. At the same time, the quotidian must be understood as a practice rather than an act or an action. It's a practice honed by the dispossessed in the struggle to create possibility within the constraints of everyday life. For blacks in diaspora, both quiet and the quotidian are mobilized as everyday practices of refusal. Photography is a vernacular practice that has historically been used by black people in diaspora as a strategy of affirmation and a confrontational demand for visibility. They are practices that are easily dismissed or taken for granted as complacent, irrelevant, or ineffectual. Attending to the complexities of quiet photographs is my way of engaging the lower range of intensities produced by images assumed to be mute. Quiet photographs demand not necessarily to be heard, they require listening instead. And strange as it may sound, I've been listening to images for years now. My image listening practices began at the City Archives in Birmingham, England, where I started listening because I was, quite frankly, overwhelmed by the sheer volume of images I was researching in a collection of photographs of Birmingham's post-war Afro-Caribbean community. That collection was called the Ernest Deich Collection, and it's an archive of several hundred photographs, negatives, and ephemera recovered from the Ernest Deich Photography Studios in an area of the city known as Balsall Heath. From the late 1940s through the early 1980s when it closed, the Daishas were the photographers of choice for members of the city's largely working class Afro-Caribbean community as a place where they commissioned portraits to keep and to send to loved ones both in the UK and in the diaspora. 
Amidst the hundreds of images of this community recovered from the Dyer Studio that I encountered in the Birmingham City Archives, there was one set of images I both literally and figuratively overlooked. They are images I've recently returned to and see quite differently today. They're archetypally quiet photos, photos that ruminate loudly on the practice of black refusal, fugitivity, and futurity. Section two, quiet photos, fugitive practices. Quote, exploiting the limits of the permissible, creating transient zones of freedom, and re-elaborating innocent amusements were central features of everyday practice. The tactics that comprise the everyday practices of the dominated have neither the means to secure a territory outside the space of domination, nor the power to keep or maintain what is one in fleeting, surreptitious, and necessarily incomplete victories. Practice is not simply a way of naming these efforts, but rather a way of thinking about the character of resistance, the precariousness of assaults waged against domination, and the fragmentary character of these efforts, and the characteristics of a politics without a proper locus. Saidiya Hartman, Scenes of Subjection. A black man stares down a camera, a full frontal pose with shoulders squared and lips pursed, sullen or solemn, glaring, glowering, or merely dismissive, fierce, aggressive, or potentially subdued, jaws clenched in suppressed rage or resentment. This is the familiar script of a black man's identification photograph, yet it's a script belied by a smart suit and a skinny tie, middle-class pretension or dapper gangster. Labels pressed to, lapels pressed to perfection, their line is marred only by a casually unbuttoned jacket. Stoic, though not without emotion, the image slides between honorific and repressive genres of the photographic portrait. The repressive genre of the mugshot and identification photos were historically used to archive and categorize criminals, mental patients, and colonial others deemed deviant or pathological. The honorific middle class portrait aspired to or proclaimed bourgeois respectability and social status. Here, however, the line between them is not quite so clear. Neither silent nor inaudible, these photographs resonate just below the threshold of hearing. They do not speak, but they are not mute. Both honorific and repressive, these portraits are a command performance of a very specific kind. Performances dictated by country and crown of their subjects and citizens. Their passport photos, images that strive to enunciate respectability and aspiration, albeit within the highly regulated regimes of social and geographic mobility. Their photographs that engendered new circuits of movement, relation and dwelling that reshaped the post-world culture of the black Atlantic. They're some of the least audible and for many most forgettable of photos. To me, the aspirational politics of these sublimely quiet images are accessible at a lower frequency. Frequencies that hum and vibrate between and beyond the leather binding and governmental pages to which they were intended to be affixed. While the passport records the circuits of movement in, of individuals in transit, freed from the frame of a leather passbook, these photographs exceed the transliteration of sites of entry and exit in stamps of date and place. Passport photos are steeped in history and memory as images invested with the power to create new lives and histories. They're images that transmit their sitters' hopes and dreams prior to travel, as well as the journeys these documents made possible. They register a transnational circuit of negotiation, negotiations of transit, passage, and connection mediated by the state, family, and community. Scholarly histories of the passport recount the deep entanglement of this document with the increasing need of states to track the movement of its citizens, identify those who belong, and exercise control over populations by certifying some and excluding others. As a technology used to regulate mobility and exercise control over citizens and subjects, Leslie Higgins and Marie-Christine Lepps characterize the passport as, quote, emblematic of governmentality as an instrument of biopower that, quote, targets the life of the one and the many, of the population as a whole, and of each individual. 
It works not only through laws and regulations securing the biological, economic, and political health of the nation, but also through the fostering of individual pleasures and passions, desires and ambitions, our very sense of who we are. In spite of the history of the passport's emergence as what Lily Cho has called a document of suspicion issued by the state and used for population surveillance, the passport photo has an equally significant lower frequency. As Craig Robertson notes, the logics of classification, evidence, and authenticity that made the passport such an effective archival technology and investigative modality also privileged these documents as the basis of a retrievable state memory, an objective mobile memory that reduced dependence on the recall of specific individuals. But how is the passport photo implicated in this investigative modality? Are these images inseparable from the regimes of state regulation and surveillance of the documents for which they were made? Put another way, is the passport photo reducible to a mere function of the passport? Returning to the photographs, it's useful dis to disaggregate the passport from the photo in order to appreciate their alternative enactments of futurity. The archival technology of these photos is perhaps less instrumental, less regulatory, and less bureaucratic than the history of the passport might lead us to believe. Our encounter with this collection is structured neither by the state nor by the mobility of the passport itself. They are found photographs, images recovered in 1990 in boxes, on the floors, and on the shelves of what remained of the Daesh Photography Studio. They are photos produced with the intent of inclusion in passports that never found their way to their pages as duplicates of the images that served this function. They're not photos that journeyed back and forth across the Atlantic. Their images left behind or not chosen. Their photos that stayed in the studio and dwell in the archive. They may be quiet, but they're anything but silent. What forms of futurity are made both visible and audible through quiet, orphaned photos that never left the studio and never traveled or circulated in the bureaucratic or regulatory regimes for which they were intended. Rather than a punitive document of constraint, for individuals like the post-war Caribbean migrants imaged in these photographs, the regulatory regimes of the passport, passport were both an effective and political circuit that facilitated their transfiguration of Britishness. It's a transfiguration that materializes in these photos not as a statement of fact or a narrative record of transit or mobility. The modes of futurity these images make audible were a concrete reverberation of the waves of reverse migration initiated by the British Nationality Act of 1948. Hailed as the, quote, formal mechanism that legitimated the transformation of the United Kingdom into a multiracial society, the 1948 British Nationality Act built on the foundation laid by the British Nationality Act of 1914, which established equal standards for naturalization throughout the empire and commonwealth. Unlike the 1914 Act, which had little significant impact on colonial migration to the United Kingdom, the opposite was the case following the Second World War. Passed in a vastly different economic climate, when the UK had achieved full achievement, um, I'm sorry, full employment, and was actively recruiting to solve its post-war labor shortage, the 1948 BNA accelerated Caribbean migrants' active exercise of the privileges of Britishness empire had long promised them. As Randall Hansen emphasizes, those arriving from the colonies and independent Commonwealth countries landed in the UK as citizens. From a strictly legal point of view, the term Commonwealth immigrant is a misnomer. Commonwealth immigrants were citizens, exercising their rights of citizenship. The quiet frequencies of these images register through their formulaic reproduction of rigid guidelines of passport photography. The rules dictating what constituted acceptable and unacceptable photographs were intended to produce uniform codes for identifying the masses and equally uniform codes for establishing belonging and inclusion. But this was not solely the domain of the state, nor a unilateral exercise of biopower. While their neutral expressions and their full frontal poses are a legacy of the mugshot and the anthropometric identification systems of, Am of Alphonse Bertillon, the emotionless faces captured in the frames of the state's photographic parameters do not reveal downtrodden, governmentalized subjects. These were individuals who had trespassed the established relation of the metropole to the colony 
and were preparing to invert the Commonwealth's migratory pattern yet again. While the empire had manufactured an idea of Britishness for all its Commonwealth subjects, of which none were ever intended to partake, these images register proud West Indians laying claim to this unrequited promise. For them, the passport was indeed a regulatory document, yet it was also an effective repository. But we do not necessarily see these affects. They require listening instead. The quiet frequencies that reverberate in these images register a failed attempt to control the reappropriation of the passport photo as a site of Black Atlantic transfiguration. These photos were both instrumental and effective conduits of the aspirations of thousands of new Commonwealth migrants who had already arrived and were beginning to contemplate new journeys. Their site of recovery in the Daesh photography studio places them at odds with the passport's intended regulation of Black Atlantic mobility. These photographs, taken not in Kingston, Port of Spain, or Bridgetown, but in Birmingham, in the heart of the British Midlands, register a quiet insistence on forms of diasporic dwelling that demanded the right to come, to go, and to stay, and to arrive and return over and again. Section three, frequency, futurity, fugitivity. Indulge me. <laughs> it's what I do. <laughs> and it's what I demand all my students do, to find their terms. Frequency. In acoustics, the number of complete vibrations or cycles occurring per unit of time in a vibrating system, such as a column of air. Frequency is the primary determinant of the listener's perception of pitch. Audible frequency. A periodic vibration whose frequency is audible to the average human. The generally accepted standard range of audible frequencies is 20 to 20,000 hertz. Frequencies below 20 hertz are generally felt rather than heard, assuming the amplitude of the vibration is great enough. In his 2003 monograph, In the Break, Fred Moden asks, what is the sound that precedes the image? Departing from Moten, my proposal to listen to these quiet images requires us to consider a different understanding of sound, a scientific def definition of sound as frequency. To a physicist, audiologist, or musicologist, sound consists of more than what we hear. It's constituted primarily by vibration and contact and defined as a wave resulting from the back and forth vibration of particles in the medium through which they travel. What is the frequency of these images? My name for their frequency is fugitivity, or what I also call the quotidian practice of refusal. What do I mean by fugitivity? It's what Moten and Stefano Harney identify as the refusal to be refused. It's what Judith Butler described long ago as a refusal to stay in one's proper place. It's a refusal I equate with a striving for freedom Ruth Gilmore has defined as, quote, the possibility to live unbounded lives. In his essay, The Case of Blackness, Moten defines fugitivity as neither an act of simple interdiction or nor bare transgression. It's a refusal to be a subject to a law that refuses to recognize you. It's defined not by opposition or necessarily resistance, but instead a refusal of the very premises that have historically negated the lived experience of blackness as either pathological or exceptional to the logic of white supremacy. The concept of fugitivity highlights the tension between acts of flight or escape and creative practices of refusal, nimble and strategic practices that undermine the categories of the dominant. Returning to the photographs, while the passport re remains a document of permission, surveillance, and accountability, the fugitivity of these images exceeds this regulatory function. Reprising Hartman, these individuals exploited, quote, the limits of the permissible and cleavages of social order in an effort to inhabit, quote, transient zones of freedom. Within the closely monitored circuits of imperial mobility created by the British Nationality Act, sorry, oh, sticky pages, they mobilized the quotidian as their site of refusal a refusal to remain either on the periphery or contained by the metropole. Their fugitivity consisted of the temerity to pursue fractal and planar lines of mobility that rerouted imperial migration 
from post colony back into the heart of metropole, only to invert it again by simultaneously insisting on both movement and dwelling in diaspora. The fugitivity of these quiet images lies not in their ability to sanction movement. For extracted from their context, these photos lack this capacity. It lies in the, in the creation of new possibility for living lives that refused a regulatory regime from which they could not be removed. These images disorder the strict terms of place and personhood dictated by a passport that reduced them to governmentalized subjects of empire. Their fugitivity is an insistence on, on being a post-colonial, West Indian, and British subject, a subject governed by the BNA, yet unmanageable and profoundly disorderly because of it. What kinds of gendered performances do these quiet images also capture? What registers at a first order of listening is anonymity. For these are nameless men whose biographical details are withheld from us, as they are recovered without identifying records or other supporting documentation. In the absence of such information, photos become a group of anonymous black men, unless, that is, we attempt to listen rather than merely viewing them. What registers at a second order are forms of masculinity transmitted through the serial repetition of four suits and ties. Viewing them, we see attributes of comportment intended to project masculine res respectability. Listening attentively to these mun details registers a polyphony of quiet, audible questions. Was the suit and tie each man wears his own? Were, they supremely respect were these supremely respectable sartorial components borrowed from a friend, supplied by the studio, or owned by the sitter? Were they purchased on this side of the Atlantic? Or were they the same suit and tie they arrived in from the West Indies? Were they Sunday dressed? Were they Sunday best? Or suits spot cleaned, carefully pressed, and worn every day? Were they suits at all, or only jackets? The polyphony made audible in these images echoes the accounts of Caribbean migrants who tell stories of dressing up to disembark at South Hall or Victoria Station because they had not just landed, they had arrived. They offer humbling recitations of their search for employment, being forced to accept positions well below their qualifications, and discrimination in housing and on job sites that are in no way visible in these images. What is equally invisible in the, is the narrative of Balsall Heath that serves as the backdrop to the fugitive lives and practices against which these images sought to image, these individuals sought to image and imagine both themselves and their future. <laughs> That context became audible to me by way of a somewhat abrupt detour I was forced to make only a month ago through my encounter with a very different archive of found photographs from the same era of Birmingham's history. They're images that complicate and refrain the fugitive practice I've just described in the archive of black British passport photos from the Daesh collection. It's an encounter that's challenged me to think more complexly about what it means to theorize the terms of a black feminist futurity. These images are not from the Daesh collection. As I said, I only learned of them recently and saw them for the first time a little over three weeks ago. They were taken between 1966 and 1968 by then photographer and later documentary filmmaker Janet Mendelssohn, who had come to Birmingham from Boston to study with one of the founders of cultural studies, Stuart Hall, on a fellowship at the Center for Cultural Studies at the University of Birmingham. These images are part of a larger series of photos that compose Mendelssohn's unpublished photo essay of a young sex worker she befriended and photographed over a two-year period in Balsall Heath, the same neighborhood in Birmingham at around the same time in the mid-1960s as the passport photos we've just viewed. Shot on the main streets in Balsall Heath, on one of the main streets in Balsall Heath, only blocks away from the Dice studio, the men pictured in this image could have been neighbors or possibly friends of those featured in the passport portraits taken by the Daishas. A surface reading or the surface narrative of these images seems relatively clear, interracial cooperation, an indexical proclamation of neighborhood tolerance, diversity, and solidarity between the police and Birmingham's new Commonwealth citizens. But the photographer's notation tells a different story. Quote, two pimps, also Heath Road. From the mid-1950s to the mid-1990s, 
also Heath was transform transformed not only by the influx of post-war migration triggered by the British Nationality Act. It was the magnet for many new migrants to Birmingham because of the cheap housing offered by li private landlords who often illegally divided the larger Victorian housing stock that marked the neighborhood's past as a formerly middle-class hilltop district of Birmingham where more affluent residents settled to get away from the pollution of the factories and manufacturing of the city center. Unlike other residents of the city, newly arrived post-war migrants were not eligible for cheaper subsidized public housing due to residency requirements and long waiting lists. They were forced instead to seek substandard housing from un un unregulated private landlords. In Balsall Heath, this led to widespread blight in an area that also suffered significant bombing during the war. The neglect of property owners was mirrored and condoned by the city council and the police who turned a blind eye to a growing, growing influx of drugs, crime, and above all, prostitution. In fact, the period these images were made, in the period these images were made, Balsall Heath was well on its way to the dubious distinction of being Britain's most notorious red light district. Do the passport photos we've just viewed register differently as a consequence of this unexpected stroll just a few blocks down the road into the broader social geography of Balsall Heath? Do the same sartorial echoes suddenly perplex us? Do suits and skinny ties still perform respectability? Or do they now register swagger? Or perhaps both? Attending to the lower frequency of these images, we must ask whether they depict different diasporic subjects or whether they are, we are encountering instead different strategies of diasporic survival. For our passport sitters could also have been the brothers on the block, Brothers who were lovers, husbands, fathers, and sons, perhaps caring or maintaining, maintaining children, siblings, and extended family. What were their respective strategies for, I'm sorry, for survival, and what were their possibilities for futurity? Do we see them in these images, or must we expand their sensorial register to the image of the images to perceive them? And what becomes audible if we listen to them as well as viewing them? The frequency of these very public images is the polar opposite of the passport photos that paradoxically constitute their visual supplement. Their frequency is the minor tenor of street life. They conjure the sounds of cat calls and curb crawlers, car horns, and, and club music. They make audible the cries of mothers on front doorsteps and children at the front, in the front yard. But my juxtaposition of these two different but intimately related set of images also gives voice to an insistent question. Why? Why make this detour? And how do I reconcile it with my investment in a black feminist future lived in the tense of the now? My answer is quite simply because I had to. I had to because as a black feminist, it is not an option to ignore or erase these potentially troubling depictions of black masculinity and the less than respectable black uh, lives uh, black men also lived in Birmingham, only blocks away from the site of production of other sublimely respectable images. I had to because as a black feminist, I do not want to fall into an easy reading of any of these images, designating some black men as upstanding and others as fallen or accepting the labeling of a black man as a pimp in ways that render a simple dichotomy of victim and perpetrator, instead of attempting to understand the complex economy of sex and sex work and the equally complicated roles men play in this economy. And finally, I had to make this detour and this juxtaposition because I see and I hear in both sets of images a common thread, desire a desire to be seen, to be photographed, to be visible, and to matter. In each case, it is a desire to live, I'm sorry, to live a future that is now because of the precariousness of black life in which tomorrow is fleeting and often too risky to wait for or imagine. Those desires were sometimes enabled by fugitive performances of respectability, and sometimes they were lived illicitly through alternative, alternative economies of desire. Viewed together, we encounter these images much differently. Their, fu their futurity 
is the quiet yet intense fugitivity of black Atlantic transfiguration, a quotidian practice of refusing to stay put or to stay in their designated place and a refusal to accept the rejection and limitations on black futurity they ultimately confronted in the UK. Thank you. Earlier you mentioned the quotidian, and I wanted you to explain what you meant by the quotidian as, an act, as a practice and not an act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. That's a big question. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to do by focusing on the quotidian is to actually bring our attention back down to the minutia of life. Um, because the minutia of life are the structures around which we navigate the world. And while we have all, or all of us who are students of politics, of struggle, of liberation, of feminism, um, have been taught an awful lot about how to mobilize, how to organize, and how to commit certain acts of intervention, I want to be able to appreciate, honor, and focus more attention on the things that get overlooked about the ways in which we engage in everyday practices, right, that are disruptive, that are interventions in the, the exercise of power and subordination. And by referring to the quotidian, one, one of the things I'm trying to talk about is, or trying to make clear, is that the quotidian is not a series of, in, of, of individual acts that happen to come one after the next. Right? They're practices that we learn to survive, that we learn to use to actually get us to, to position ourselves in the world. So the focus on the quotidian as a practice is to really think about it over the long durée, as a durational thing, and not as an explosive one-time or multiple intervention. It's how we live our lives and make a difference, even if we're not doing massive organizational interventions that are about a deed, right? Looking at the, the four men in their passport photos, yeah. um, as soon as they came on the screen, I'm so sorry, um, okay. I, I noticed that one man in particular wearing the black suit, he looks very similar to my grandfather who's from St. Kitts and has, well, he had dual citizenship and I immediately had a lot of difficulty focusing <laughs> because I kept thinking, I kept filling up my mind with listening to what, what, what stories I would hear were that my grandfather and what stories that would be if it was my family and thinking, well, did, did they maybe live, um, his relatives that went to England, did they maybe live in this, in this district? Was that, was that what their history was? Was that what I'd be listening to if I were looking to portraits of them? Um, but I had to stop myself and say, just because this person is similar in terms of location um, and because it's a familiar face and I wanted so badly to, to listen to that similar familial voice in mm -hmm. a photograph that I needed to stop myself and say this is a different person and they have, a, they have their own story and not fill it up with, with what I was thinking. And I just wanted to know if, if, in, if in your own studies and research you had that same difficulty because it is quite difficult looking at a familiar face and immediately wanting to see how that relates to your family tree and how to distinguish that because it's, I find that it's so much easier studying people not of my own ethnic background in that sense because mm -hmm. I can distinguish myself from them and I know that we would not have the same background. Well, you're actually describing precisely what I was, precisely my thought pattern when I first saw these images as well. Um, and because I was dealing with so many of them, and we're talking about hundreds of them, right? Um, not hundreds of the passport photos, that's a different interesting story, but hundreds of other portraits, these were part of a collection of hundreds and hundreds of images. Um, that your first reaction is to see in that image what you want to see in that image, right? To see in that image both maybe a physical resemblance to your grandfather, but it's not even, it doesn't even stop there. It's not even that specific. It's a particular genre of photograph, right? You, what you recognize in that is a particular format that speaks to you, that you associate with something else, right? So it doesn't even have to be somebody who looks like your grandfather. It could be somebody, it could be a photograph that looks like that photograph, which is what my response was. And 
that's really what actually took me in the direction of listening, right? Because I needed to figure out a way to organize both this volume, this mass quantity about what do, how do you organize hundreds of photographs that mostly look the same, right? That one way of doing that is to come up with categories, right? But the categories, if you leave them in the visual realm, they simply keep telling you what you want to see, right? <laughs> but to background what you're seeing and to think about the stories that made these images possible, right? So not necessarily the exact story of that man, but what had to have happened in order for him to be there and take a photograph like this, right? To go back to a historical context and allow that photo to tell you that, to listen to it. That's really the kind of method that I had to develop in order to do exactly what you're saying, which is to not um, internalize this as the story of my family, the story of my grandfather, right? Or the story of any specific person. Because the other thing about these images, the, the, the portraits as well, is that they're generational, right? They tell the story of an entire group of people who were taking the same kind of pictures at the, all, at this, all at once. Right? They were streaming in and out of this photography story, uh, studio because that's what they did as a group, as a social group in diaspora. They wanted to actually use these photographs to connect to somebody, so they all took them. One, one observation and one question. Um, the gentleman in the dark suit that we were just, spoke, that we were just speaking about, mm -hmm. when, you, when he was first presented to us, all I could really focus on was his eye because it looked like he had a black eye and that, mm. and that it was swollen. Mm. And I thought it was curious that um, you didn't comment on that. But I thought that, um, so later when the other pictures were presented, I wasn't so far from the zone of there being, of thinking that there's a complexity there. Mm -hmm. But I wanted so much to believe the, um, the easy reading mm -hmm. that I told myself just not to look at it. So I just was, it, it's interesting observing my own observation of this that I chose to block out what I had observed mm -hmm. to fit into the, to the narrative. Mm -hmm. So that's my observation. And then the question that I have is about the picture on the left of the, mm -hmm. of the small children. Mm -hmm. If you could speak a bit about how that um, added to your reading of this and why of all the pictures you chose that one. Um, thank you for the observation. I, you know, I hadn't seen that as a black eye. I did see it as some some kind of discoloration. That's part, partly because in the, that's partly because of the nature of these images, which is that um, the passport photos, um, unlike the portraits that I that I viewed in this collection, um, the passport photos were mostly not available as prints. They were available as negatives, and not just negatives, but as glass plates. So, I what I had to do to actually get access to them. And it was really interesting because on the glass plates you would see his retouching, the photographer's retouching. And it was done in ways, you know, in really kind of um, rudimentary ways like with a pencil to sort of even out somebody's skin tone or possibly to lighten somebody's skin tone depending on, you know, what their preference was. So my first interaction with them was as dark spots, <laughs> right, on a piece of glass that I could only turn into positives through a scanner that reversed them, that inverted them. So there's part of me that doesn't trust certain details like that because I saw the actual um, glass plates that, that they were produced from. So there's a kind of restraint that I, have to, um, that I have to maintain in terms of those particular kinds of variations and differences. So that would explain what my reaction to that is or why I might have overlooked it. Um, about the, the photograph on the left, um, I chose that one because it represents, well, okay, so this group of photographs, the, the, um, the Mendelssohn photographs, the story of the Mendelssohn photographs is that they were never published and that were found by a researcher last, last year, actually two years ago, um, in the files of the Center for Cultural Studies, um, some of them, um, when it was being dismantled. And a researcher found them as, who was hired to actually put together an exhibition curating the impact of this you know, phenomenal and legendary center that you know, changed what uh, interdisciplinary work looks like. Um, and he 
got in touch with the photographer who was still living and in, living in Boston, who sent him more of them and gave him permission to, and donated them to the archive. So one of the thing is that I, thing is that I had uh, access to only a few of them in digital form. So there's only a few of them that I can share. Um, the other thing about it is, is that from the ones that I saw, um, because I viewed most of the entire collection, um, what's so remarkable and striking about them is that in this photo essay of one young woman, one sex worker, the, it's the story of, it's a photo essay of her, her husband, who is also her quote unquote pimp, their two children, um, and their extended families, right? Um, and they have extended families, and they're both second generation migrants um, who came to Britain from elsewhere. Um, and what these images do is they create this picture of both street life and domestic life. And that domestic life was blurry, and it wasn't either about public or private. And so I chose this image because it actually gives us a sense both of the geography of Balsal Heath. And that's why I put it together with um, this, this set of images. Because I wanted you to get a sense of literally what is the physical geography, what did it look like then. And the ways in which that physical geography was so constrained that the street became part of the domestic life of these individuals. Right? So I wanted you to see the extent to which there was a kind of pervasiveness of uh, the fact that, that families were not just indoors, children were not just indoors. You didn't have that kind of stratification. And the juxtaposition of these images with those of um, the street life was the fact that these were all blocks away from each other, or, if, or only a block away from each other. One of the other things that I did while I was in Birmingham um, last month um, is that, you know, after seeing these images, I literally was walking around Birmingham looking through her lens, seeing this city and seeing its inhabitants through her lens. And so I felt the need to actually go to Balsall Heath and to walk the distances between the different sites, streets that she had photographed and the dive studio where it originally was. And I spent about two hours just walking through all these little windings, winding streets and they're quite proximate. And so one of the things that I wanted to bring out through the particular selection of images is that penetration of street life and domestic life. That what does it mean to live in this particular set of um, physical circumstances? And the extent to which this was also a neighborhood that didn't get demolished as a middle class neighborhood. It remained, it had those pockets. And there was a kind of flow between them that lasted all, up until this day. So that's the background behind that particular, um, that particular image. Hi, um, thank you for this amazing lecture. Um, in trying to keep sort of the really brilliant theoretical work you were doing around tents at the beginning, alongside your super nuanced readings of the photos, um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about the um, theoretical stakes of this as an archival project and the sort of past tense of that um, and like looking backwards to try to articulate uh, a like mode of futurity and, and sort of like your work yeah. as a scholar um, and like why, why it's so important for this project that these be archival images as opposed to images drawn from our contemporary. Yeah, yeah, well that's a great question, really hard question. Really, really great hard question. Um, <laughs> um, my investment in it being an archival project has a lot to do with the power, as somebody trained in history and somebody trained as a feminist theorist, of the necessity, the utility of the speculative or subjunctive reading. That there is an accountability that I think that both historians and feminists <laughs> have to, to being able to tell a story of what was and at the same time to tether that story both to the historical context that we can reconstruct around it, but to not let that overpower the possibilities and the choices that were made. Right? And that's a really 
fine kind of tightrope to have to walk between to collapse it into simply a story that, to, to collapse photographs, historical photographs, into simply illustrating the story or the narrative or the history that we already know, and not allowing them to tell other stories that, we, that are too easily disregarded. So there is a really deep investment that I feel and a deep commitment that I feel to marking this as an archival project that demands a certain kind of accountability and nuance and rigor and scrutiny, right? To really sort of say, this is my encounter with this archive. And that encounter is structured by all of these do's and don'ts, right? And it's structured by all of the baggage that we bring to it. It's structured by all of the things I don't want to get caught out on, right? And that the the most honest way that, that I've learned how to make, to, to do this kind of research is by making that visible um, in the way in which I present it, in the um, extent to which my reading isn't the reading or the only reading or even the definitive reading. It's to open them up and to urge everybody to be able to participate in that process of analysis. May not be a <laughs> But it's going to be fun. <laughs>